Greetings and salutations, Cleveland, Ohio, and the rest of the world. Welcome to a special edition of Open Door Live with Vince Robinson. I'm honored to have two guests, and hopefully soon I will have three guests. But this is all in preparation for an event that's going to take place at Wings Academy this Friday at 6.30 p.m. I'm going to put up a link to Eventbrite, and you can go there and get your tickets for this very important event. It's called African-Centered Education. What is it? Uh, is it relevant? Yes, no, and why? And to answer those questions, we have two extremely brilliant, talented, intellectual brothers, uh, Anthony T. Browder, who, as you know, is involved in the excavation of Karakamun's tomb in Luxor, Egypt. And we also have Dr. Chike Akua, who is a professor at Clark Atlanta University, and his specialty is in education but you will come to know him as an African-centered educator, and we're really happy to have him on board with us. And we also have Nana Kwamina II, who you may know as Dr. David Whitaker or Kwa David Whitaker to some. So the gentlemen who are here, welcome to Open Door. My pleasure to host you. Thank you, thank you. Great to be here with you, Vince. All right, so, um. Nana, I'm going to toss the first question to you. I'm sure it was probably your idea, but I'm going to ask you the question that you felt needed to be asked, and that is, what was the genesis of this event and this project? Well, Vince, we know from our studies and we know from our scholars and we know from our prophets that one of the most powerful institutions in the world is the institution of formal education or the development of the next generation of people. So I often say that if people are dissatisfied with their country, their government, their state of affairs, indirectly, whether they know it or not, they're issuing an indictment against the education system that has developed all of the population. And if the population is developed poorly, the adults will obviously make poor decisions. They'll make poor plans and they will implement the plans poorly because they have not been prepared. So uh, despite the very popular opinion of the public about American education, American education is actually uh, if it was in a medical model, it would be in intensive care. It's in critical condition. Despite its popularity in the minds of the, the average person, uh, in a global comparisons, U.S. education scores around 35th in science and math, and 24th or 25th in science. So there are 35 countries or nations that perform better than the U.S. student that has received this very popular and believed to be excellent educational preparation. I did a little study not too long ago and found that in China over the past several years they have discovered that Chinese third graders no longer routinely outperform American high school students. And they consider this very small slide in comparison as a crisis situation. So they don't understand why their third graders can no longer routinely outperform U.S. high school students. So I would say to us, all of us that value education, we value the development of young people, that if the Chinese third graders are no longer outperforming American high school students and the Chinese people consider this to be a crisis, we must recognize that the system that we have is in a crisis itself. And I was concerned enough about this, and I know 
uh, Dr. Chika Kua and I know Tony Browder, and we're all involved in education directly and indirectly with young people, students, and also community members, adults. And anything that's a crisis in America that affects the country as a whole, we know it is that much worse for urban students or black students or African-American students or descendants of African students. So I see this and have seen this for some time as critical. So if we have a crisis and there's a need for immediate attention, I felt it was appropriate and is ongoing uh, appropriate to call together the experts, the people that have studied these things, that practice these in this area, and have a discussion about what is this African-centered education, which we believe is important to our students, particularly uh, urban students. And it, we believe it's important for all students to have an understanding uh, that goes back and takes advantage of our ancient traditions in Africa upon which much of education is been structured around, even though it, the credit is not given as it should be. But I felt it was important to have a discussion from experts that have studied this for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, to bring information to the public that will help them orient their thinking and be begin to have available to them some concrete, specific things that they may be able to do as a prescription to help improve the lives of their children, their community members, their institutions, so that we might survive this situation that is only worsening. And I doubt that anyone would disagree with my assessment that what is is critical is actually worsening every day so i called upon uh, my colleagues my friends my uh, comrades to see if they would be available for such a discussion and maybe give some insights to the public some prescriptive uh, steps that could be taken to actually improve their uh, ability to work grow and prosper so that was the, the genesis of the discussion, and I'm happy that um, both Tony and Chica were available. I figured if they were available, they would not say they would not be willing to participate. So that wasn't, uh, so it was only availability. And so here we are, I'm very thankful. And so that's the, that's the genesis of this conversation. Okay, I want to properly introduce uh, Dr. Akua because he has quite an impressive resume. And as I do that, perhaps you can text or reach out to Tony and see if we can bring him into the broadcast. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Dr. Akua is an assistant professor of educational leadership at Clark Atlanta University and an African centered leadership strategist to colleges, universities, educational conferences, and urban schools internationally. He develops African-centered curriculum resources. As the author of 11 books, he's written and published several books and parent-teacher guides designed for today's students. Education for Transformation, The Keys to Releasing the Genius of African-American Students is a book for teachers and leaders that is used in a number of urban school districts for professional development. It's also used in a number of colleges and universities for preparation of pre-service teachers and leaders. The book, Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations, Seven Steps to Black Student Success, is also used at a number of high schools, colleges, and universities by students and those who serve him. Uh, Dr. Akua's research has been published by academic presses in the following publications. African-Centered Education Theory and Practice in 2020, the Journal of Black Studies in 2020, and the Sage Encyclopedia of African Cultural Heritage in North America, which happened in 2016. So it's obvious that you have established a footprint when it comes to African-centered uh, education, and that's one of the reasons that you are with us today. Uh, let me just ask you first, uh, 
What are you involved in now? What would you like to promote so that we can get that out there and folks do know about it? Well, certainly the books that you mentioned uh, would be very helpful for our listeners, but also as a prescription and a solution, I highly recommend uh, that your listeners check out readingrevolution.org. Readingrevolution.org. That is our literacy program, uh, our culturally relevant and responsive African-centered um, literacy program that assists our students in their reading comprehension, vocabulary development, uh, grammar, and writing skills. It's a collection of 90 brief reading selections about Black heroes and sheroes, ancient and modern. And it contains a captioned video, a brief captioned video for the reading selection, and then activities that build uh, reading comprehension, vocabulary development, grammar, and writing skills. So again, uh, people can go to readingrevolution.org for a free demo of that online platform. Uh, and it's, uh, it's getting tremendous results with so many students, but parents love it as well because many of them weren't exposed to this information when they were growing up either. But you know, Vince, uh, one of the things I'd like to do before we go any further is to define African-centered education because I find that there are a lot of misconceptions about what it is and whether or not it's even necessary. And until we have a good definition, uh, I've heard all sorts of things from, from people and parents who say, well, uh, we're not in Africa, so we don't need an African-centered education. Or I want my children to be able to interact with all people, not just Black people, so they don't need an African-centered education. Well, <laughs> comments and responses like that tell me that people really don't know what African-centered education is. So to be clear, African-centered education is centering ourselves and our children in the best of our culture to examine and analyze information, meet needs and solve problems in black communities. Now I wanna break that down so that we're very clear about what all this means. African-centered education means to center ourselves and our children. We can't expect our children to be centered or operating from their place of power if we as the parents are not. So African-centered education is about centering ourselves and our children in the best of our culture at a time when many of them have not been exposed to the best of the culture, but have really been exposed to the worst of the culture. And they begin to associate blackness with violence, criminality, uh, academic underachievement and negativity. That is not our authentic culture. That is an alien culture that's been injected into our community. So again, African-centered education is centering ourselves and our children in the best of our culture and using the best of our culture as a lens to examine and analyze information, meet needs and solve problems in black communities. And if you're not meeting needs, if you're not learning how to meet needs and solve problems in your own community, that cannot be said to be an education, that's schooling or that's training. But for many of our children, they're taught to meet needs and solve problems and make money for white people or other people, not how to meet needs and solve problems in their own community. So oftentimes they're, they're taught and trained that if they get good grades and then they can go away and leave their community never to return. But African-centered education teaches children how to meet needs and solve problems in their own community. Yeah, I, I think it's important to uh, talk about the genesis of education in America as we know it when it comes to public schools, because I think it was Rockefeller who decided that the purpose of education should be for cultivating workers and not cultivating thinkers. So when you look at that paradigm, you can see why, to a large extent, as uh, Nana has indicated, that there is a crisis in education simply because education, for the most part, is not serving us. I mean, you you have people who can afford to go to schools like Harvard and Princeton and some of the Ivy League schools that get into those colleges and universities because of the fact that they have privilege that affords them the uh, you know the opportunity to go. But then you know when you look around and and you look at the the Supreme Court decision that came down this year you can see those doors are closing. So 
there's opportunity out there, but it's not for everybody. And then when you look at the content of the education, you know, I, I can speak as someone who went through 16, 17 years of education and through the process, I'm looking at the books and I'm asking myself, well, where are we in here? <laughs> and when I asked my high school history teacher, what were we doing in the 20s and 30s? And I know that we were enslaved and I know that Dr. King was assassinated. But what happened between those events? And the reason that he couldn't tell me is because he said he had not been taught. So, you know, when you when you look at education and you see that students are failing after they get to the third grade, that critical time in their development, and things kind of fall off, then you can look up and see how we're not graduating to the extent that we could. And even if we do, graduation is no guarantee of success in this country. Well, the other thing about that is even if you go through the school system and graduate, you can go from Secret year, to Vince is frozen. Pardon me? I said Vince was frozen. Oh. Uh, as I was saying, even if you graduate from these systems of schooling, you can go from pre-K to post-doctorate and still uh, not learn anything about the truth about your history, your culture, or how to meet needs and solve problems in your own community. You can have all sorts of degrees conferred to you, bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctorate, and, and all those sorts of things, and still not be able to meet needs and solve problems in your own community. So the problem is not education. The problem is schooling. And there's a difference between the two. Uh, and Walimu uh, Shuja tells us the difference between schooling and education. Schooling is for the purpose of reproducing current power relations. What does that mean? That means if there's a certain percentage of our people who are unemployed or underemployed, then the purpose of schooling is to reproduce that reality. If there's a certain percentage of our students who fail, uh, you know, certain tests, benchmark tests at, at different grade levels, then the purpose of schooling is to reproduce that reality because people get paid when we fail. That's a whole nother conversation, but people get paid when we fail. So if there's a certain percentage of our people who populate the prison industrial complex, then the purpose of schooling is to continue to populate that school to prison pipeline preschool to pr prison pipeline. So schooling is only for the purpose of reproducing current power relations. And if black people aren't in, po in power or empowered, then the purpose of schooling is to keep us out of power. Education on the other hand, again, uh, teaches a person how to meet needs and solve problems in their own community. So we have to ask ourselves, are we involved in schooling or education? I think it's pretty clear that for the most part, we're involved in schooling. But the reason that Nana Kra has called us together for this dialogue this evening and on Friday with the community is because we want to chart a course toward proper education, African-centered education that teaches us how to meet needs and solve problems in our communities. So let me ask a follow-up question in, in light of the fact that your resume includes so much hands-on. Uh, what impact are you seeing as a result of curricula that you have developed? Uh, I'm seeing a couple of different things. One of the things that we see a lot of is where students mentally opt out. You may have heard of dropout rates, but some of the studies show that our children mentally opt out many years before they physically drop out. And we call this uh, uh, diseducation. So for example, we know Carter G. Woodson back in 1933 talked about the miseducation of the Negro. And that is receiving a process of schooling that does not prepare you for life as you will face it, okay? But Mwali Mubaruti talks about the fact that miseducation leads to diseducation. Diseducation is an anti-learning psychology, and it causes a child to mentally check out. In other words, you've lied to me so much, now I don't want to learn nothing. So when you go into a number of urban schools, you see a lot of our children who are disengaged um, and who have not, who, who have opted out of education. One of the challenges with, for teachers and educational leaders is that many of them have not been exposed 
or been under the tutelage of a master teacher who knows how to get tremendous transformational results in a relatively short period of time. Many of the leaders have not been under a master administrator who knows how to turn a school around. And so what happens is most teachers and leaders are not really familiar with, with what's possible for our children. So no one can live up to low expectations. They go in and they see how children are acting how, and how children are performing, and they assume that that's all we can do. So what we're missing is the standard. And that standard could be found, obviously, in ancient times in some of our uh, original civilizations prior to European invasion. But that standard was also evident prior to integration. Uh, and this is something, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to talk to our elders about the standards of excellence that were available in black schools prior to the Brown versus Board of Education 1954 decision. There was academic rigor, there was excellence, and, and black children were held to a standard by outstanding black teachers who had higher credentials than many of their white counterparts across town. Um, and so if you have not been exposed to what's possible for our children, then it will be very difficult for you to produce excellence, especially under the current circumstances? Well, I have to say that it's really important for folks like Nana Crow Kwame II to just have the idea that this is something that we need to do and see it through. I remember having a conversation with a principal at a local high school, and I was asking him about some of our Afrocentric scholars. I asked them about Dr. Renoko Rashidi and Dr. Leonard Jeffries and and others and he had never heard of them yeah he's drawing had, a complete blank i'm sure a, a complete blank and then i recall having a conversation with uh professor mwatabu okanta who currently is a chair of department of africana studies at kent state university and he was telling me how there were educators in the east cleveland public school system who went through all those years of schooling and had no idea about the importance of understanding being African or anything having to do with Africa, uh, which leads me to ask this question. When was it for you that you woke up to the idea or the notion that there was a connection between you and Africa? Uh, well, thankfully, I grew up with, with parents who infused some of that culture into our family life. But um, I would say that the real awakening took place uh, in college, in undergrad for me, where I began to be exposed to the writings of Dr. Naeem Akbar and his book, um, uh, Breaking the Chains of Psychological Slavery. And then, of course, uh, my life has come full circle because I was also exposed to Tony Browder's work in his book, From the Browder Files, and also now valley contributions to civilization these small books though they were small or thin were very very powerful and made me begin to they begin to answer questions that i didn't even think to ask and they these books set me on a course toward reconstructing our history and culture and not only seeking to live it but to produce other resources and materials uh, that parents, teachers, and students themselves could access so that we could put ourselves back together as a people. One of the things that I noticed um, is something that I refer to as cultural identity theft. We know regular identity theft is when someone steals your personal information to gain access to your resources. Cultural identity theft is when someone steals your story and replaces that story of accomplishments mm -hmm. and contributions, replaces it with a narrative of degenerate and negative behavior and stereotypical images. And so what happens is how do you take the group of people who gave the world reading and writing and language and literature and architecture and engineering and agriculture and astronomy, mathematics and medicine and science and technology, how do you take that group of people 
and convince them that they're a race of pimps, players, criminals, thugs, N-words, and B-words. Cultural identity theft. And so for us, for conscious and committed educators and parents, education is identity restoration. Again, education is identity restoration. And it helps to provide a firm foundation for our children to understand that blackness should be associated with excellence and achievement, not degenerate behavior. You know, there's so much to unpack there. When, when you think about the history of America and all of the things that we have contributed to, not only society here, but around the world. I mean, if you look at GPS, it was a sister that brought it to us. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Internet, it was a brother that did that. When you, when you look at things like cell phones, again, it was us that did that. Uh, but at the same time, we have people who are attempting to rewrite history and whitewash it even more than it was before. But as a counterbalance, and perhaps this is just a reflection of algorithms, but when I log into Facebook and I look at Reels, I'm getting black history every day in my news feed. I'm, today I saw an article about the man who brought the song Nature Boy to Nat King Cole. You know, again, not something that I would see in a history book, but it's there. So, you know, despite their efforts to to suppress us in terms of understanding who we are and our, our identity and how much of a contributor to the success of the globe we have been, um, there are things that are happening to, to, to bubble things up to the surface. So you have education, you also have social media that is serving some. Now, the other side to that, though, with social media and algorithms is the computers are trying to guess what you want to see. So if you're involved in looking at degeneracy, it's going to bring you more degeneracy. Right. You know, so but we, well, we do have tools. Do you do you see a role for social media in in terms of bringing uh, education to the masses? Absolutely. But like you said, the way the algorithms are set up is you will only be able to see that which you're seeking. So if you're seeking to see uh, people fighting and fussing and debating and all that kind of stuff, then then the social media platforms will continue to feed you that because that's part of how the algorithms are programmed. And it's interesting that you use the term algorithm because if you read Ivan Van Sertema's book, Golden Age of the Moor, he tells you that the, the word algorithm comes from the name of a black man. And his name was Alcorazim. Al-Khwarizm wrote a mathematical text that was used um, back in the medieval period, and it was called Algebra wal Mukbala, and it had some of the basic rudiments of what we today call algebra, but the man who wrote it, his name was Al-Khwarizm, and that's where we get the term algorithm from. But if we stay with this example of cultural identity theft, I want you to think about this, Brother Vince. Have you ever been trying, have you ever tried to get into one of your accounts? It could be your bank account. It could be your social media account. It could be one of your accounts to pay a bill or something. And you weren't able to get in because you didn't have the right access code or password or login. Has that ever happened to you before? Absolutely. Yes. yes. And, and you know how frustrating that is when you can't find your password and you can't gain access and nowadays, they even have what they call multi-factor identification, right? So you have to authenticate your identity. They're going to send you a code, and then you, you got you to click a button to prove to a robot that you're not a robot and all this other kind of stuff to gain access to your accounts. So imagine now if you were not able to retrieve your login or your password or these access codes you wouldn't have access to your resources or your accounts. And that's one of the challenges that we're facing from a cultural perspective. It seems like we've lost the access codes to our cultural power. And until we understand our, our ancestral identity, or as, as Tony Browder tells us, AI is not artificial intelligence, but ancestral intelligence. Until we reconnect to that, that is our access codes to our greatness. And this is why there have been and continue to be tremendous attempts to erase our history and our culture. 
I recently wrote a piece in the Washington Post about this uh, that you can find if you Google my name with Washington Post. It came out on Marcus Garvey's birthday on August 17th of this year. Interesting. Um, I just happened to have been recommended a book by a dear friend of mine, Stephen Boyd. It was Dr. Akbar's The Community of Self. Mm. Very yes. profound. Tremendous and, book. Once I got exposed to that first book, it was called Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery. And then he later revised it. And now it's called Breaking the Chains of Psychological Slavery. But once I was exposed to that book, I devoured all of his books. And at the time that I was exposed to it, I was not a reader at all. But I would go through and I would read them and highlight them. And so I believe the community of self was, was may have been his first or second book. But all of them, like you can't go wrong by reading any of his books. So I highly recommend them. Well, one of the things that I gleaned from that book was just how the image of Europeans has been used to push us away from self-identity. So when we look at what we see as God, for instance, and you look at who the model was for that image of Jesus or the person that they call Jesus over all these years and know why that was, and then you go to a black church and you see that image up, it's no wonder that people are confused. And then you go to Africa and you see the same thing. You know, it's, it's just, it's mind boggling, but it's the fact that their heroes are the ones that are in the statues and the images that we see. And we don't see the same in our own community, which is why it's so important for us to connect with those heroes and sheroes, you know? And, and it's important also to acknowledge the men and the women, as we live in this patriarchal system that has us looking at men and not women. So we have to lift up, lift up the sisters who did what they did. Uh, just important for us to know ourselves, just to know who we are so that we can understand the power that resides within us. I always go back to Imhotep. You know, when I think about Imhotep and then I look around and I see people who exemplify certain aspects of Imhotep, it's, it's no wonder that we have skills and gifts and we have an ancestral connection to that that results in us being who we were in the past. And as you say, it's important for us to remember those things. And that speaks to the importance of history. Um, could you talk a bit about your connection to Africa and perhaps some of the places that you have been that have inspired you to continue to advocate? for that knowledge? Sure, as I began to be exposed to knowledge of self in undergrad as a student at Hampton University, and this, by the way, was through a campus organization. It wasn't necessarily through the classes I was taking, although I did have a great experience there. Um, I was part of a group called the African Studies Cluster, and I went through traditional African rites of passage, and that's how I received my first name, uh, Chike. Uh, some people pronounce it Chika, Others, Chike. If you go to the continent, it would be Chike. And of course, names in African culture are very significant because your name call, uh, tells you your history, where you came from, your identity, who you are, and your destiny, what you're supposed to be doing uh, at this particular place and time on the planet. And so, given that fact of how powerful names are, it shouldn't be surprising that one of the first things that was taken from us was our names and our languages, which had sacred meanings. Every time a name is spoken, it's a subconscious spiritual reminder of your purpose for being on the planet. So uh, I went through traditional African rites of passage and had the opportunity to study with some of our great scholars like Tony Browder, like Nana Kra, uh, like uh, Naeem Akbar and Jawanza Kanchufu and others, uh, Asa Hilliard, went through an initiation with him as well, Dr. Joyce King. Uh, my first trip to the motherland was in 2005. Uh, and I, from 2005 to 2010, helped to lead over a thousand uh, young people and adults on tours to Egypt through the African Genesis Institute out of, out of Philadelphia uh, with Brother Ali Salahuddin and uh, Mama Helen Salahuddin. In addition, I also uh, have been to Ghana a couple of times, Senegal uh, a couple of uh, one or two times, 
uh, as well as Morocco. Um, and so what this has allowed me to do is to make certain connections. And certainly, uh, Nana Kra has been very instrumental in that. Just this past September, uh, on our recent trip to Ghana, I was installed as a chief. And one of the reasons that I was installed as a chief um, in the city of Moray, which is near Cape Coast, is because the people there, just as we have been miseducated in America, they recognize that some of their systems of education are miseducating them as well, and they are reconstructing their history. And one of the things that they know is that they are the descendants of the ancient Kemites or ancient Egyptians. There were many mass migrations out of the Nile Valley of Africa to the Niger River Valley of Africa. And so that they know and are piecing together that history and they have uh, asked for assistance with their educational programs. And that was one of the reasons why myself and brother Tony Browder was also uh, installed as a chief there. So we've been able to make some strategic alliances uh, to be able to provide some educational resources. And we look forward to continuing on that journey. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I had heard and perhaps it was on um, a journey that I took to uh, Egypt with Dr. Rashidi that there may be uh, a presence of a Dinkra symbols in the Meru Netra uh, there in, in Egypt. Uh, are, have you done any research or have you come across anything that indicates to you that there might be that possible connection? Oh, it's not a possibility. It's an absolute connection. And actually, Tony Browder was the one uh, to, to, to break open that revelation. Because he is the first uh, Black person or first African American to uh, be in charge or to direct an archaeological excavation in Egypt, he has had access to a number of tombs that are closed to the public. And so he was the one, and I believe it was in the tomb of Patti Amenope, where he looked up in the ceiling and saw the Sankofa symbol. Now, most of the current day Arab Egypt, uh, Egyptians, they don't know anything about Adinkra symbols. They, they didn't know what they were looking at but he immediately knew what he was looking at. And so the thought is that the ancient Kemetic Nile Valley civilizations predated the West African civilizations. But it's very clear uh, that there was some symmetry there. And, and it's also clear now that the Adinkra symbols are much older than we previously thought. So there has always been this interplay between East Africa and West Africa. As a matter of fact, Dr. Hasimi Maiga tells us West Africans are not really West Africans. They're really East Africans who traveled West. Let me break that down because it's going to sound confusing. When we talk about ancient Kemet or Egypt, sometimes people with a little bit of historical knowledge say, well, that's interesting, Dr. Kua, but African Americans were captured from West Africa not East Africa, and that's, that's not incorrect, but it's terribly incomplete because there were six documented mass migrations out of the Nile Valley of Africa when it was inundated and invaded by the Persians, uh, Greeks, Romans, and Arabs. Those mass migrations of Africans going from East to West Africa, they set up the great empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, because they took their culture and their science with them. And that's what allowed them to set up those great empires, which were similar to the East African empires of Kemet, Nubia, and Kush. So again, East uh, West Africans are not really West Africans. They're East Africans who traveled West. This is what Dr. Shekanta Diop refers to as the cultural unity of Black Africa. Another thing that I wanted to address um, is the notion on the part of some in our community that the enslavement that we have understood or known about for so many years did not in fact happen. And they talk about us being indigenous to this land and whatever for whatever reason they're pushing back on our connection to Africa. 
Uh, do you have any thoughts about uh, us being indigenous to America and the extent to which we were enslaved as Africans? Sure. One of the things that's confused me about that argument is that it's an either or. When you hear it being talked about, it's an either or argument. Either we came from Africa <laughs> or we came from America. And uh, the reading and research that I've done shows that we came from both. Uh, certainly, you know, the origins of of humanity are from Africa. But we also know from the research of uh, Dr. David Imhotep, who has written the book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented research. And he uses archeological studies to show that African people were in the Americas over 50,000 years ago. Again, Africans were in the Americas over 50,000 years ago we weren't waiting for Columbus to tell us that the world was round. We knew that thousands of years ago as well. And we had traveled all over the world. The difference is when, when uh, Africans came to the Americas, we had a cultural exchange with the indigenous population rather than cultural extermination with the indigenous population. So yes, many African-Americans have Native American roots, that and African roots. And there's nothing wrong with claiming both. <clears throat> so yes, America is mine. I teach our children to say America is mine. This land is my land. And I have as much right to it and all of the, the resources of it as anybody else. We also, however, have a very uh, wealthy continent called Africa, where our Brothers and sisters over there are literally standing on top of the wealth of the world because the natural resources in Africa are what provides the standard of living that we enjoy here in America. We couldn't have any of the, the comforts and conveniences that we have without the natural resources in Africa. So Africa has the resources and it has the historical and cultural traditions and people that we need to reconnect with. So this yes. issue of Native Americans and Africans, it's not either or, it's both and. Yeah. Well, you know, I find it kind of ironic that it was a brother from Elmina who was the navigator of the ship that brought Columbus to the Americas. Mm. Mm -hmm. So had he, if he had that knowledge, then perhaps there were others that had the same knowledge and they had been doing that for centuries. Uh, there are factions of us who don't ascribe to uh, Dr. Van Sertema's book, They Came Before Columbus, and again, probably some of the same folks who, uh, you know, ascribe to this notion that we're indigenous and not African, but I think that's really interesting. I want to bring Nana into the conversation. He's been an innocent bystander <laughs> for a few moments. <laughs> but um, a student. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's one of the beautiful things about knowing you, Nana. I have learned so much and I have a degree in Pan-African studies. <laughs> but I learned so much after I exited the classroom and, and I have to admit, uh, I'm gonna blame Dr. Edward W. Crosby because I took one of his classes, probably one of the last classes that I took and he introduced me to the banking concept of education. Mm. And after that, I was ruined. I, I thought, I'm not going to be exploited by these folks any longer. And I had my dad telling me, it's time for you to get into the real world, son. I, I was going into broadcasting and I didn't need a PhD to be a news announcer. <laughs> um, but uh, so much. And uh, Chike, you, you mentioned names. Uh, Nana is actually the one who gave me my name. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I thank him for that. You know, it, it's giving me another sense of purpose now that I know that born on the Thursday means something. And my last name, Ansa, also has a connection to filmmaking and, and the, the lineage of, of Elmina, Ghana, as, as a result. So uh, thank you to him for that. Uh, Nana, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, what was the genesis of your connection and your love and your commitment and passion for Africa? Well, I think for me, uh, I'm reminded of Amos Wilson's uh, thesis, it was not a thesis, it's a, 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 
a fact, actually. <laughs> he said, every educational system is designed to achieve the goals and objectives of the ruling parties or communities or leaders of a society. So the purpose of education is to recreate, as Chica has said, is to recreate the people with the consciousness that people believe will be most beneficial to the perpetuation of the society. So as you take that theme and think about us as uh, African people here or black people here or descendants of Africans here, you have to step back and look objectively as what is the value that we provide for the society. And if we understand that we are the machinery to run the society, then the education system, as far as we're concerned, is focused on recreating us and maintaining us in the position that we will be beneficial to achieving the goals and objectives of the society and as it sees itself ongoing and continually uh, recreating itself. So as you mentioned, uh, Yao, that there's no desire for us to be doctors, lawyers, thinkers, architects, and all these things. So one day it dawned on me that there was something wrong. I didn't know what was wrong, but it seemed that something was wrong. And I have been always inquisitive enough and risk-taking enough to ask questions or make statements about what I feel is wrong and take the lumps and bumps that come with questioning things in a quest to get a clarity about what is going on here. Uh, Van Sertema made a statement once. I was interested in math as a student. It was my favorite subject. And I listened to one of uh, Ivan Van Sertema's lectures that was actually on an audio tape. And he was talking about Roman numerals that I was always fascinated by because people said that they were so special or something. But Ivan Van Sertima said, now when you look at Roman numerals, you must realize that you can't do math calculations with Roman numerals. You can't multiply, divide, deal with equations, algebra. He said, this is not a functional numbering system that you can do anything with. And it, it said to me that there's something that's been concealed that is very, very important. And he just made it seem so, so simple when he said it. He also said this, another statement. I don't know if it was in that same discussion or another one but it shook me when I heard it. And he mentioned that the pyramids that sit, that stand and sit at the Giza Plateau were older to Jesus than Jesus is to us. Mm. When I heard that statement and had to think on it, and this was around 2000, so I'm thinking this is 2,000 years that we've known of the image and concept and life of Jesus. But those pyramids were older to Jesus than Jesus is to us. That was a profound awakening for me. And then as I started to study, I realized that the pyramids incorporated the Pythagorean theorem, which was named after a man that wasn't born until around 500 BCE, and the pyramids was over 3,000 years old. So I said he, it couldn't be named after him because it existed and was in use, and I can see that for myself. Then in my math studies, I realized that they said Euclid was the father of geometry. 
And I looked at Euclid's birth. Euclid wasn't born until the, the, the late or early BCE period. And the geometry, the geometric shapes were already in existence long, long before that. So it just reinforced in my mind that I was being lied to. And these lies were for some reason, and I had to get an understanding of what that reason was because the things didn't make sense. And what I could see as physical evidence, when I went to, the, went to Egypt the first time, 95, and saw those f structures and the tombs, I knew for sure without any equivocation that we were living in uh, a bunch of fairy tales that were hiding all kinds of important information for us and our people uh, that would be motivational and inspiring. And I was on a quest to figure out how I could do something about it to tell other people what I had found out and We've all been on this journey and quest ever since. Let me mention one thing that Chica has touched on too. I, my training is in educational psychology. So a lot of that is related to testing. We have tests for everything. Uh, we have ac achievement tests, aptitude tests, intelligence tests. Uh, and it's amazing to me that we say we have intelligence tests and we admit that people are using about 5% of their intelligence. And the people that may be using 5.2% of that intelligence, we call geniuses, um, which means that 94 to 95% of our intellectual capacity is not even being used. So we should all be referring to ourselves, Einstein and everybody else is basically retarded because we're not using 90% of our intellectual capacity, which leads me to believe that our ancestors had tapped into more of this capacity. And on occasion, we have our brilliant ideas, which gives us uh, some insight into what our true potential is. It just comes to us in flashes. And we have an idea. Oftentimes, our ideas, we don't even know where they come from. They're not things we're thinking about. They're things that we woke up understanding somehow. So we know that there's a vast, vast repository of information, wisdom, that we occasionally tap into or it's introduced to us. And as soon as we see it and feel it, we know something that we didn't know before. And one of the things that inspires me so much about African-centered education of all the testing that we do, the one thing that we have not been able to test for, but we know it's powerful, is motivation. The things people can do when they are properly motivated, or they find themselves between a rock and a hard place, or a woman's child is trapped under a car and she gets, gains the strength somehow to lift that vehicle off of her baby, tells us that there is so much power related to or triggered by our motivation. So the greatest teachers, the greatest educators in the world are the people that have the capacity to motivate others to want to question, dig into things, be disciplined enough to stick to it. And these are master teachers that become motivators because motivation will be the game changer on any occasion if we could just increase the motivation, attach discipline and persistence, anyone could do almost anything. So the students that we've had at our school, I've been most excited about the students at the school that people have written off. Like I was written off myself. You may have been written off. You just didn't talk to the people that were uh, not counting on you to become anything. Uh, 
but to be able to, to, to gain some ability to motivate young people to want to be more, to want to do more, to want to excel. And I find that, as Chica said, African-centered education is centering yourself and your students. And I'm, I'm convinced that the African in, African-centered environment is inspiring to students and it's tapping into something that can be uh, elevated within them to produce a sense of personal pride, a sense of confidence, a sense of courage, a sense of risk-taking in order to move themselves to a place where they can do better, they can lead, they can achieve, and they can set an example for other students. I'm most inspired by a lot of my students that leave our school who were not really the best math student. And I see them and they say, you know, I'm in, I'm in high school now and math is really easy. I said, I see, I told you it would be easy. Now you wish you had those notes that you didn't take in my class, don't you? Because they would help you even more. Uh, so you can instill something in a person and you see them years later and you realize that they have been working on that and using that and uh, it's inspiring to those of us that are trying to teach and trying to guide and just do our part to uh, help uh, recover our identity, as, as Chica has said. And to recover our identity is recovering your purpose and recovering the reason that you're on the planet. Uh, and once you live your life in a purposeful way, you are no longer working you're no longer bored, you're no longer tired, you're no longer out of ideas because the work is endless and you have the endless capacity once you're on your purpose to just do everything you can as long as you can, as best you can, so that you leave your mark and let somebody pick up where you left off. Well, so that's I have... Story. OK, I, I have to point out that teachers are some of the most underappreciated folks in our community. They're underpaid, you know, they're understaffed, you know, in so many situations, they have to come out of their own pockets to provide resources for the students. And we really need to lift them up. Um, and how many times have you heard from a person that it was a teacher that they had in school, elementary school, high school, whatever, that inspired them to be who they are today. It's just so vital that we have this conversation. Uh, I want to also lift up the fact that, you know, some people talk about opening schools, but you opened a school and you have been operating that school and it's been very successful. I've been witness to students at your school and, and see what they go through and see how they get a greater sense of self just because of what you are feeding them as students. So I just want to wish success, continued success for you and continued success for Dr. Akua here in his efforts to not just reach students at one school, but reach students at many schools, colleges, and universities across the country. Uh, I want to... Uh, continue to talk about this event on Friday because that's the reason that we're here. I didn't want to give away too much of what was going to be talked about. That's why I asked some of the questions that I asked because I just want to whet folks' appetites and I'm hopeful that we get a good turnout on Friday uh, because there's just so much for, for us to learn. Just what I learned from Dr. Akua this evening and what I continue to learn from you. So uh, let's talk about Friday. It's going to start at 6.30. Uh, folks can go online. They can go to Eventbrite. And all they really have to do is choose Cleveland as the location and put in African-centered education. And it will bring up a prompt for them, which will give them an opportunity to purchase tickets. I see that they are going for between $12 and $40. This is a fundraiser. So this is a time to yep. be generous and to support something that is important to us all. You know, I also want to underscore the fact that it's important for us to have these schools because you cannot depend on your oppressor 
to give you the knowledge and information that you need to liberate yourself. That's why we have to educate our young so that they don't just grow up wanting to play football or basketball or be a rapper so that they can become knowledgeable about all the possibilities in life and so that they can discover their purpose because it's so important. You know, you, you talk about day names that gives you a certain sense of purpose, but you got to go in and do some digging and figure out who you are, figure out what edifies you, what you enjoy doing, what you would do for free. All these things are things that we can plant as seeds in our children as we cultivate them, raise them to be productive members of society. So again, uh, 630, 2450 Prospect Avenue, uh, Wings Academy. You can go online and uh, take advantage of this link to Eventbrite and get your ticket. You will uh, be able to hear Dr. Akua, and I know he's going to bring it, just like I know his colleague, uh, Tony Browder, is going to bring it. It will be a learning opportunity for everyone, not just the young, but the old as well. Uh, any closing thoughts, uh, Chike, before we sign off? You know, one of the things that came to mind as Nana was talking in, in agreement with what he was saying is that all of the research points to our brilliance from the time we come out of the womb. If you look at Amos Wilson's seminal work back in 1976, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, he does a review of white studies about black children about black infants that when they come out of the womb doctors run tests on them uh, mothers who are listening to this right now may remember the apgar test when their child was born there are different tests where uh, they see how long it takes out of the womb for a child to sit up for a child to roll on its side for a child to track you with its eyes across the room as you're walking or moving across the room. And they measure how long it takes to do that. In all of their studies, Amos Wilson shows this in his book, uh, The Development of Psychology of the Black Child. In all of those studies, black children outperform all other children. So from birth, we come into this world ready to deal. Our problems start when we start going to school. <laughs> That's so I'll, amazing. I'll leave it right there and I'll cover the rest on Friday. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll look forward to a full explanation and deep dive into that rabbit hole because, again, it is so necessary. Uh, Nana, anything that you want to add before we conclude? Well, I'd just like to add that anybody that comes or views this program, they will also get an immersion into the Akan culture that is the foundation for this school and the foundation for uh, African-centered thought. Um, doesn't have to be a Khan necessarily, but that's the largest ethnic group in Ghana, so I say a Khan. But they will have an exposure to what African people traditionally look like, do, govern themselves, organize themselves, and it will be a great experience from that context as well. You will, will see something and be a part of something that you may have never seen before other than on documentaries or TV programs or YouTube, but this will be live and you will be a part of it. The other thing I would like to, to, to tag on to what Chica's saying, uh, if we put the two things together, the, the African descendant child at birth is carrying the pure DNA that has been passed down for eons and generation after generation. And it's incumbent upon the system that needs that child to be a Comply, compliant worker that doesn't want a lot of compensation, you have to take steps to begin to alter the functioning of that DNA. Otherwise, that child is a problem. All right. Profound indeed. And uh, so looking forward to what will happen on Friday. 
Uh, we will post more information on this link so you'll be able to go to YouTube. Uh, we'll also be posting this on Facebook. So if you are not able to get everything now, you'll be able to go to Facebook and YouTube and click on the link to get to Eventbrite to purchase your tickets. And we will look forward to seeing you there. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for joining us on this special edition of Open Door Live with Vince Robinson and look forward to attending the event on Friday. Peace, prosperity, and progress to everyone. And as always, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, and make today your best day. Chica, see you on Friday. Peace and blessings, Nana, and thanks so All much. Good. All righty. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. All righty.